Well, as probably you realize, I am a child of the 60s, which means a lot of different things. But one of those things is that I grew up on the Beatles. Any other folks out there? Yeah, a lot of us. Yeah, we're not in that millennial group, are we? Yeah, we need to figure out a way. Yeah. You know, when we had them stand up, one of the challenges of our presbytery and of this church is ways we can really welcome those of all ages. And we're going to be doing more of that. And so I'm wanting y'all to tell me the things that you want that will help you feel more welcome. But for those of us who grew up in the 60s, we loved the Beatles. And so, of course, when Paul McCartney came to town, I had to go see him. So Kevin and I went to see him, and I loved it. And it was funny. I was sitting next to a woman who was about my age. And uh, before the concert began, she's like, have you ever seen him before? And I said, no. She goes, oh, he's just amazing. And she went on to tell me all the time she had seen him in concert and went on and on. And so once McCartney came on stage, she was literally breathless uh, and overwhelmed with emotion and screaming at times. (laughs) Now, not quite as intense as I've seen some things before. So I want us to take a look at this video from 1963. Now, This is a concert of the Beatles, and I want to remind you that this was before they ever played on the Ed Sullivan Show. So for those of you who know about that time and place, after they played on Ed Sullivan, everybody went really crazy. But watch this. Watch the crowd. It's good sound that you these days. Check it out. singing because everybody's screaming so much, right? Okay, I never did that, just so you know. Okay. Well, did you see the expression on the faces of that crowd? Yeah, they are fully engaged, right? Their mind, their heart, their soul, their bodies, they are into that experience. And you know, I have to say, I think there's a little bit of worship going on there, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, There was awe on their faces. Now, they weren't worshiping the one true God. They're worshiping those four young men from Liverpool. But if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we all worship all kinds of things and people because worship is really our response to what we value, to people we value, and to things we value. And quite honestly, some of the purest forms of worship are found outside the walls of the church and have nothing whatsoever to do with the God of all creation. Just drop in on a concert someday or or go to a sporting event and watch some amazing worship. People are really going for it and they're lifting their hands and they're standing in awe and they're pledging their allegiance to whatever. And if you think about it, history has never known a shortage of worship. Every culture in every age has had its gods they worship. In the book, The Air I Breathe, Louis Giglio says, You, my friend, are a worshiper. Every day, all day long, every place you worship. It's what you do. It's who you are. You can't help but worship something because it's what you were made to do. He goes on to say, Should you for some reason choose not to give God what God desires... You'll worship anyway, simply exchanging the creator for something God has created. Worship happens every day, all day long. But here in the faith community, we are called to worship who? God. So what is Christian worship? Now in the Hebrew uh, Bible, the word for worship literally means to fall prostrate, to fall flat on the ground with your face down on the ground so that you will not be distracted by anything else so that all your focus is on one thing and you are humbling yourself before God. 
Now, in English, the word for worship literally means giving worth or value to something. So when we worship God, we are giving worth to God. We're saying that we value God. We are glorifying God. I find it really interesting in the Ten Commandments, the very first two commandments. The first commandment was, you shall have no other gods before me. And the second was, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth below, beneath or the waters below. Now think about that. Before God said anything about any other activity, before he told them not to murder, not to commit adultery, not to commit sin against their neighbor, God said they must worship only God. And there wasn't a commandment to worship. It was a given. We would worship because that's how we were created. We were created with a desire to worship. And we need to remember that worship is a verb. It's not something done to us or for us, but by us. And worship requires activating our whole being our heart, our mind, our soul, our emotions. It's an activity in which we fully engage. You know, God's call to us is not to come to the worship service. God's call is to come and worship. And quite honestly, uh, that's become increasingly difficult in our passive society because we are so used to being entertained. Uh, we watch movies and plays. We watch television um, we run on our treadmills with our headsets so we're listening to something or we ride our stationary bikes watching TED. I watch TED on my little iPad as I'm riding my um, elliptical. And so it's not surprising that when we come to worship, we end up merely going to church instead of worshiping God. So when we gather here, we are called to gather not as an audience, but as a congregation fully engaged. Years ago, I went to a worship conference, and the speaker was talking about how we've really gotten things messed up as an American people in the church. And he talk, called us to remember the early Hebrew worship and the early Christian worship, and he said something very significant. He said none of those earlier worships, worshipers gathered so they could get something. They came to give of themselves to God. You see, worship is not about watching others lead and in fact, that was one of the major points of the Reformation. Uh, the church had kind of forgotten what worship was, and only the priests led worship, and it wasn't even in the language of the people, and the music was unsingable, and, and Martin Luther came along, and he said, no, 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 no. And the language of worship was changed. The scriptures were made available to people. You didn't just have to be an ordained priest. Uh, he put words of hymns to familiar tunes so the people could actually sing in worship, and he encouraged participation from the congregation. Because worship, corporate worship, when we gather together as a community, is about everything we do from the moment we arrive, from when we walk up on this, in this place and we greet one another. That's worship. When we come in here and we hear the announcements about how God is calling us into community, sometimes we think, oh, I don't need to hear the announcements. That's about cultivating authentic community, hearing how we can come together. When we have a child lead the call to worship, and it's not just somebody up here saying, okay, we're going to worship now. It's a call and response. It's something from up here and the people, and it's the person leading the call is from the congregation. Um, it's about how we together pray. It's how we sing. It is our body language and our facial expressions. Years ago when we were... Just in the church house, there was a man in the congregation who really didn't want to be here. He only came because his wife insisted. I'm sure none of you do that. Um, but he would sit on the front row, right in front of me, with his paperback book, like this. Now, I got his message. Do you think I got his message? Yeah. He wasn't worshiping, was he? Yeah. But the interesting thing is, him doing that, really affected my ability to lead worship. And I think a lot of times we don't realize how that every person in here, how you come to this worship experience, how you are engaged in this worship experience, affects every single one of us. If you're sitting next to this man holding this book, you're probably thinking, well, what is wrong with him? He's not paying attention. You know, you're distracted. It really distracts those leading. We're not able to be fully present to God.
I often talk with our seminarians about the importance of learning to worship, how it's not about performing. It's not about performing. It's about giving your all to God. And there's a world of difference between performing and worshiping. And that's true for every single one of us in here, not just the person standing up here. The expressions on your faces affect everybody in here. And it affects all those that are leading up here. And your smiles and positive uh, interactions lift people up. But you know, so often we turn worship into a consumer event. And every one of us do it. In fact, that's a prayer that I have every Sunday as I'm getting ready to lead worship. God, help me not to focus on whether the, whether the prayer of confession was on the slide or not. Does it really matter? We still prayed, didn't we? But it's real easy to go, I can't believe that one slide didn't work. <sighs> you know? Or when the microphone goes out and all of a sudden we're all going, oh, the microphone went out. And we forget we're worshiping God. Now we want to give our very best. We want worship to work. We want everything to go smooth so we're not distracted. But the reality is we are human beings and sometimes things don't work the way we want to. But true worship is about us giving ourselves, our hearts, giving our life to Jesus as the kids sang this morning. Offering our lives as a sacrifice to God. And that's what Paul was talking about in the letter to Romans that Steve read for us this morning. Uh, The scripture we read from Romans 12 Uh, Verse 1 is actually known as the hinge verse for the whole book of Romans. Paul begins that by saying, therefore. And and I've told you before, anytime a writer says, therefore, you got to know what came before. Because all that came before is leading up to the point he's going to make right after that. And so, in Romans, in the first 12 chapters, Paul has described all that God has done for us. And how we weren't doing too good at it. And that so God came in the person of Jesus to deliver us. And he tells us that salvation is a free gift and we receive the gift by faith. And he describes the freedom we experience as part of God's family. And then after he's laid all that foundation, he says, therefore, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Or as we read in the message, Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. So the way we worship God is not just about what we do within this space. It's about how we present our bodies, our whole beings, heart, mind, and soul to God as a sacrifice. And we need to remember that in Paul's day, they were still bringing animals to sacrifice. Uh, they'd take a ram or a lamb and, and a bull, and they'd bring it to the altar in Jerusalem. They'd slit its neck and lie it up on the altar. And as the sacrifice, well, <laughs> the good news for us, <laughs> we don't have to offer dead sacrifices. Aren't we glad? <laughs> we don't have to do that. But our response, not that we have to, our response to the love of God is that we give ourselves. We are walking around sacrifices that honor God all day long, and it's all about God. It's not about us. So how do we offer our lives as a living sacrifice? How do we worship 24-7? You've heard me frequently talk about my family as I was growing up, and I grew up in a deeply spiritual, um, very committed, Christ-centered family. And our life was formed around worship. Every Sunday we gathered with others in faith communities to worship corporately. And you know, quite honestly, even though the church I grew up in, the worship wasn't really that inspiring. Um, I thought the music was kind of slow and the sermons were kind of dull. I would have never missed In fact, I never even thought about whether I'd go or not because I wanted to go. It felt good to my soul to stand there and sing those tell me the stories of Jesus. It felt good to place my offering in that offering plate. It felt great. I remember the first time I said the Apostles' Creed by memory. And I felt good that I could do that. I remember a woman sitting behind me, leaning forward and hugging me and said, I noticed you said that by memory. I don't know how. I was little and I still remember that. 
I was offering myself. It wasn't about what was going on up there. It was about what God had done and my response, my love for God in that. Now, when we went on vacation, we didn't miss worship. Never even thought about it. We went to whatever church was closest to whatever motel we were staying in. And it didn't matter if they were Presbyterian. It may have been denominations we'd never even heard of. And I experienced some worship that is very different than what I was used to. But it was wonderful because I learned that worship was not a social thing. Worship was not about uh, everybody seeing that we were there. We didn't go home and tell everybody where we went. We just went because we wanted to glorify God. And it was awesome. But the other thing for me growing up is that my parents um, gave their lives as an offering. They didn't just go to church on Sunday and then come home and turn into, you know, Attila the Hun. Uh, my parents gave their whole lives. And it wasn't just about money. My parents really never had much money. My dad was a social worker. Um, yet I remember things like my dad giving money to my grandmother's gardener because he didn't have enough money and he needed something. And somebody gave him money. I remember him buying a cord of wood for someone one winter and... That was a lot of money for us in those days, but he knew that that family had a fireplace and it was cold and he gave that as a gift. Now, we never went out to eat. I laugh now at how often we got to We never went out to eat. And my mom made most of our clothes. Um, we had one television in the house. It was black and white. In fact, the first time I saw color television was when I started dating Kevin and they had a color television and I thought it was just amazing. Um, I never had a car until I got married and Kevin bought the car. <laughs> And I didn't realize we didn't have much money till later in life. It never crossed my mind. And so giving to God had nothing to do about financial resources. It had to do with our hearts. My parents always gave generously. One thing that really touched me was after my mom's death, I was going through all the boxes and boxes, and I found a box with, they were much more organized than me, every income tax return from the very first year of their marriage. They kept them for however, you know... And the interesting thing was from the first year of their marriage, they always gave 10% to the church. And then they gave more to other mission-type things. And I looked, I thought, this can't be possible. And I looked to the years, my dad was unemployed for a year and a half. But every once in a while, he'd get an odd job, gave 10% to the church. They got through. I got married while they were unemployed, and we had a wedding. How did that happen? I don't know. God provided. I was in college at that time. I never... Miss College, now I worked from when I was 15 on, always, but, you know, God took care of us. Their meager resources did not stop them from giving of themselves, but it wasn't about just writing a check. Uh, my mom would make meals if somebody was sick and took them to them. She delivered meals on wheels for years. Uh, she was also what's called a care ringer. That's with Faith in Action Senior Access. Uh, she would, in the home, in the afternoon, she would call people who were homebound, and she would visit them. Didn't cost her a dime cost her time and her energy. She gave, made, uh, highlighted people's days that couldn't get out. My dad was a social worker, and so one thing he did as a way to give of himself was he would counsel people at our church one night a week he would, for folks that couldn't afford to have a therapist. So my mom would be his little secretary and sit outside because you would never have a, you know, a man in an office with somebody you know, without another person in the building. And so he'd, she'd sit outside and be the, you know, whatever, gatekeeper, uh, and he gave of himself that way. It wasn't about money, it was giving his life. Um, I can't remember a time when one or both of them weren't teaching Sunday school or being youth sponsors, and none of those things that they did because they felt obligated. I never heard them say, oh, I've got to go do this. They loved it. That was the joy they had of giving of themselves, and it was act of spiritual worship. There are a couple of you who are smiling because you knew my parents, and you know what I'm talking about, and you remember that. My parents showed me through their lives what it meant to be touched by the love and grace of Jesus and how we respond to that. Now, it's different for every single one of us. But they responded in the way they could with their particular gifts, with their particular resources, and in a way that gave them joy. You know, worship is how we, how we live our entire life as an offering. It's not just about the worship service. And it was never meant to be a spectator sport. It's meant, it was never meant to be just one hour a week. And it was never meant to be about us. It's about God and giving glory to God. And it's how we respond to God's love. 
Now, we are entering our second week of our 30-day church challenge of ways we can be a vibrant church family. And it's not just about how we're a vibrant church family. It's about each and every one of us have a vibrant life of faith. Last week, the challenge was for you to think of ways to engage in the community by joining some type of small group or or participating in some kind of activity where you can get to know other people in a casual setting. And lots of people did that. I think last week at our Sunday lunch out, we had a record attendance of folks. Several people said they'd never been before and came last week and enjoyed meeting people. Well, this week, I challenge you to discover ways that you can offer your life as a sacrifice to God. It's going to be different for every single one of us. It's going to be something that you enjoy, that gives you joy of where you can share the love of Christ. Last night, Kevin and I were talking about the ways people have done that here. And so often we get in our head that, that offering worship is only about, you know, singing on the praise team or reading scripture. But we start talking about the ways people here have offered their lives as a sacrifice. He said, you know, yesterday we were up here you know, working on this building, we had people hammering uh, plywood up there. We had people scraping up the floor. We had people picking up trash. And every single one of those people was giving their life as an offering. He talked about how Linda Ward came up here to give sandwiches to everybody. And she was overflowing with joy. He said she was just bubbling with the joy of the Lord as she handed out food to people. Um, we talked about how Lou Suters has been up here Every day for weeks and weeks working on our sprinkler system so that we can have some plants that are growing. And then he power washed the the cross out here so things can look nice. And, you know, he doesn't complain. He does it joyfully, he says, because he doesn't have to do it. He does it because he wants to do it. Kevin said, well, what about all those people? 22 people last week went to Trinity Care Center just to show those people that we love them. We talked about how there's some people in this congregation who never, ever, ever say a negative word. Have you ever met somebody who never says a negative word? It is so wonderful. And there's some people who do that, and that lifts up this congregation. That is an act of worship. Everything we do can be an act of worship. Everything we do actually is an act of worship. So I challenge you. Open your heart to the love of God. Let that love just embrace you. And then respond in whatever way God has called you to do. And then we will all be cultivating that life of worship. Let us pray. Gracious God, we we do so want to worship you with our whole being. And and sometimes we limit ourselves. We limit what that looks like, and we get in our head that it can only be one way. And so, God, we just ask that you just push out the boundaries of that box and help us to see ways in which we truly can take our everyday, ordinary lives and place them as an offering before you. Give us creativity into the ways we can share your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.